Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to the third and final session of the Socialist Action Conference on Revolutionary Social uh, Strategy. And of course, my name is still Elizabeth, and I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action and a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island known as North America. And we fight we join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Now, before we get into our speakers in that, I would like to read a revolutionary greetings from Greece. You have already heard greetings uh, from, from uh, Ireland uh, with comrade Jackson here today and also last night Greetings from Mexico. So these are from Greece. Dear comrades of Socialist Action Canada and Socialist Action US, please accept the greetings of OCA, OKDE, the Greek section of the Fourth International, to your educational conference and to all members of your organizations. For the last two years, the globe has been facing a pandemic that has illustrated many of the weaknesses of the capitalist system. Governments have shown their tough faces through restriction of freedoms, prolonged lockdowns, anti-labor laws, seemingly without any proper possibility of resistance. The pandemic highlighted also the unacceptable state of healthcare systems, which without enough sanitary materials and staff do not seem to be able to cope with the pressure of COVID-19. However, despite this bleak situation in Greece, already since March 2020, several sectors mobilized from hospital doctors, nurses, and workers in retail trade who were exposed to great danger to workers who were forced to distance, often working without equipment or even regular working hours. The working class has understood the necessity to react from the beginning of the pandemic and not to postpone the struggle. In addition, there have been extremely massive mobilization of students and teachers, professors against the new educational reform, which creates additional class barrier in education and creates a suffocating work environment with continuous evaluations. Once a month, one month ago, it was exactly a year passed by since the conviction of the Nazi criminal organization Golden Dawn and huge anti-fascist demonstrations of that day. However, the anti-fascist struggle isn't finished. We must always be alert. At the same time, although cuts in financing, health and education are being made. Military buildup is escalating. Our government, a loyal ally of Western forces in NATO, doesn't stop equipping its army and forming alliances such as the recent defense agreement with France. Although Comrades, we are far away from each other. We feel that our organizations are very close as our views coincide, coincide in both the theory of revolutionary Marxism, transitional demands and permanent revolution, but also in practice with the aim of building a revolutionary party and the struggle for class independence of the working class, the self-determination of the oppressed against imperialism war, imperialism, war and any kind of oppression. We send our best wishes for a fruitful conference, and we hope that in August we will manage to meet as many of you as possible in the summer schools of tendency for a revolutionary international. We truly appreciate the efforts you make to promote the ideas of revolutionary Marxism in North America. Sharing the same goals, we are proud to stand with SA Canada and SA US in TRI, a common project we started together. We hope this conference will prove to be very helpful for your members and friends. And it's from Fanny uh, of OKDE Greece. Okay, so now we will once again get back to our conference and the session is titled Permanent Revolution. What is the theory of permanent revolution and the allies concept of combined and uneven development? Examples of their application today, including the anti-imperialist United Front. The speakers are Gary Porter on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and Jeff Mackler in Oakland, California. Gary and Jeff will each speak for about 30 minutes. Then, that, then after that, we will take questions from the online audience to which Gary and Jeff, of course, will respond. So let's begin. Gary Porter is a leading member of Socialist Action and is the SA branch organizer in British Columbia. 
He was chair of the investment committee and a member of the Board of Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. Gary was first vice chair of the Certified General Accountants in Canada. He is currently a fellow of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada and a life member. So welcome, Gary. You have up to 30 minutes. Gary, you are muted. You'll get to it. Imagine that I gave up a whole minute to uh, being unmuted. That's okay. okay. Um, so thank you, um, Comrade Elizabeth, uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we, we have heard about a little bit about the theory of permanent revolution already in our seminar, and it's partly because our theory is not it's not separate chunks. It's a very integrated and uh, and um, you know um, varied but integrated theory. Leon Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution is one of his most important theoretical contributions of many. It was introduced in Results and Prospects, which was published in 1906, uh, right after the revolution of 1905, and more fully developed in the Permanent Revolution, published in 1930. Trotsky's theory drew on his observations <clears throat> on experiences in the Russian Revolution of 1905, in which he played a leading role. He also drew on the work of other revolutionary thinkers, including Karl Marx. Marx believed that the West, rising Western European business class of the 17th and 18th centuries played a progressive role in sweeping aside feudalism and preparing the way for capitalism and democracy. He described how the French Revolution of 1789-83 accomplished the liquidation of feudalism, mostly by cutting off the aristocrats' heads. That's, that is a kind of final solution. And uh, ending the absolute monarchy and such, and such feudal norms as internal customs duties, feudal obligations on the peasantry, and an aristocratic state and military system, all of which had fettered the development of the productive forces of society. He also noted that the French Revolution established representative democracy and land reform. And, his, uh, and this prepared the way for industrial capitalism's later development. By the time of the revolutions that swept Europe in the year 1848, which let me remind you was also the year of the publication of the Communist Manifesto, um, much of Western Europe had begun to industrialize. And of course that can only happen with the rise of a, an urban working class. So we had a rising industrial bourgeoisie and we had a, the rise of their mortal enemy, uh, the working class, without which of course they can't make any money. Marx observed that in Germany, a country that, that then, at that time was economically backward in Europe, uh, a rising liberal bourgeoisie and its struggle against the still powerful remnants of feudal nobility was unable to fulfill its historic role of unifying and modernizing the country, unlike its earlier French counterpart. Feeling threatened by the growing working class, which did most of the actual fighting in the revolutionary movements, the erstwhile liberal leaders froze in fear and attempted to negotiate with the forces of reaction before their movement uh, finally collapsed. Similar dynamics played out in other less developed areas of Europe, Germany only united and became a, a country in 1879 under Prussia led by Bismarck. And only after Kaiser Wilhelm's abdication and flight to Holland at the end of World War I was Germany introduced to a form of bourgeois democracy, the weak Weimar Republic. This showed that the working class, um, wait a minute now, in more developed France, the revolution, which also took place in 1848, uh, as I said, it swept across Europe. Um, the bourgeois Democrats there were also unable to advance any further democratic social reforms. And the reason is, again, they're trapped between their goals of, of opening up more, uh, opening up the economy for, uh, for, market, for the market system on the one hand and the working class underneath them which uh, they were terrified of. 
And of course, uh, what you had emerging was the working class, the working class who were becoming more and more aware of their differences with capitalism and their own demands, their own needs and their own demands. The working class could not, as Marx analyzed it, could not depend on the treacherous and vacillating bourgeois. Marx most famously used the term permanent revolution in a March 1850 speech. He was referring to a working class strategy of maintaining political independence, and we hear that a lot this weekend, the independence of the working class, with a consistent series of militant political demands and tactics. This prefigured Trotsky's later theory, which built on Marx's ideas and, as, and asserted that it would be up to the working class to carry forward the struggle against the remnants of feudal despotism and open the way to social advancement in countries where capitalism had developed late and only partially like Russia. Unlike Trotsky, Marx did not believe that society could move directly from control by a semi-feudal aristocracy um, to, a, to the work, working class power. He envisioned a period of rule by the petty bourgeoisie small shopkeepers, you know, which consists of small shopkeepers, craftsmen, and, um, and well-off well peasants. After the abolition, uh, okay, the bourgeoisie intrinsically opposed to the interests of the working class would have an interest in preserving capitalist property relations. And in such a situation, power would be contested between these two classes. Continued independent working class struggle would be necessary. A permanent state of revolution or a permanent revolution would be necessary until a socialist transformation of society was achieved. Trotsky drew on these insights to analyze the situation in the early 20th century Russia, which had only abolished serfdom in 1861. Russia was still largely under the control of feudal landlords who together with the military and the church propped up the backward czarist autocracy. and impeded the country's economic development. Russia had begun to industrialize in the 19th century, late 19th century, with much of the investment coming from foreign financiers and from feudal nobility and from the state. Because of its history in which, uh, because of its history in which trade was discouraged and during which the country developed as a militarized state on guard against foreign invasion, Russia had long been worried about, about Germany. Well, specifically, since Prussia had organized a, a German state composed of 39 former states in 1879. Russia had a weak independent or a weak independent bourgeois class, and the state took on industrial development. Industrialization happened much later than in Western Europe, and in a top-down fashion. For these reasons, Russia's bourgeoisie was unable to modernize and develop the country as a whole. The, the industrialization took place in Petrograd and Moscow and a few other places, but it was not, it was, uh, and it was made up of the most uh, modern forms of, uh, of technology, but it was too weak to carry it out across the country. In his book, 1905, Trotsky explained these class dynamics against the backdrop of Russia's overseas imperialism. Here you had an imperialism that was based on um, uh, a much more complicated scenario than in the Western European countries. There the capitalism had evolved, had, had developed, uh, started cutting out competition, forming monopolies. The monopolies had, had, uh, had merged uh, their, uh, their uh, efforts with the banks and the financiers to form financial capital. And then they started spilling out of the country and investing capital and the trade uh, in, in uh, colonial countries. Russia, where you didn't have a fully developed bourgeoisie, you did have a monopoly because these were large, uh, you know, they, they came into capitalism, as we'll discuss later under combined and uneven development. Um, they were very modern forms of technology and they formed very large corporations. So even in that odd situation, and they did develop some imperialism. However, they were not, they didn't have the, the economy or the, um, or the structures they had, you know, they didn't have the uh, efficiency of a capitalist system. Um, and so they lost to the Japanese in the war of, in the, in the war in the, around the turn of the century, early 1900s. 
that was the first time an Asian country and Japan itself was developing um, a capitalist class. That it was the first time that an Asian country had defeated a Western European country in centuries. Uh, this caused great stir in Russia and was one of the contributing factors to the revolution of 1905. In his book, 1905, Trotsky explained these class dynamics. Oh, uh, Trotsky described the vacillating role of the liberal bourgeoisie in the subsequent revolution of 1905. The Russian bourgeoisie originally opposed czarism and, they, and originally wanted um, uh, to abolish the, the, the czar, the position of czar. But they quickly abandoned it in support of the support of the revolution and tried to make accommodation to the state. Of course, what happened was the workers were again the main body of the revolution, and uh, they uh, they were the masses in the streets. There's no way you can have masses of bourgeois in the streets. They're a tiny minority, um, and you and you um, they set up the Soviet. This was the first appearance of Soviets was in the 1905 revolution, and of course the word Soviet means council. It's a workers' council. Uh, Trotsky became chair of that of the Petrograd uh, Soviet. So with the bourgeoisie up against this mobilized working class and which had already set up an instrument in the Soviet that posed the question of dual power, the bourgeoisie uh, abandoned their, their, uh, their quest to get rid of the czar and settled instead for the creation of a Duma, which is such simply a Russian word for parliament, um, which had very limited authority under the czar. The czar did not relinquish much of his absolute rule. Um, so, as I say, Trotsky was the chair of the Petrograd Soviet before it was crushed militarily and the revolution failed. Unlike how Marx had, had seen the revolutions in 1848, Trotsky felt the events of 1905 showed something different, uh, somewhat different, that the tasks of national development and democratic reform and land reform in Russia, which in more, which in more developed uh, countries, had been carried out by the ruling class would now have to be accomplished by the working class, by a working class revolution and workers' power. Now they would have to win the support of the poor peasantry, but the peasantry would not participate in, in the leadership. Trotsky drew on Marx's insight in the working class. Sorry, Trotsky drew on Marx's insight that the working class would then need to continue its own independent struggle against the bourgeoisie's attempts to maintain capitalist property relations. In such a situation, the working class would have to carry through the socialist transformation of society. Trotsky's theory was not widely embraced when he first came out with it. Uh, even within the socialist or even within what at the time was thought of as the Marxist movement. Marx uh, had described that many societies progress through increasingly complex levels of organization throughout history. The French Revolution was a milestone in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Capitalism in turn has its own innate contradictions that would be overcome under socialism when production would be organized and run collectively by the working people. Marx's analysis of history was interpreted by many in the, 20, in, in the early 20th century many socialists in the early 20s in a linear and one dimensional way that everybody would have to go through these steps and they would go through them in a more or less, uh, uh, in a very similar ways. So that's what, uh, how they saw it. They didn't, they didn't have the flexibility the, that Trotsky had in, in adapting Marx to the real situation. According to this view, this uh, everybody goes through the same path, uh, which was held by the Mensheviks and non, the non-Bolshevik faction in the Russian Marxist movement, Russia could not advance to socialism until capitalism had been fully developed. Since Russia was far from being a fully developed capitalist country, this view led to a political strategy of supporting liberal allies, in quotes, the Mensheviks saw the liberal bourgeoisie as, as their allies, in overthrowing czarist autocracy and the remnants of feudalism, based on the notion that the, of yeah revolution in stages, this approach would be repeated later 
uh, and lead to disastrous consequences for the working class. Actually, the Stalinists, uh, after the defeat of the revolutionaries in the Soviet Union and the rise and the consolidation of Stalin's leadership, uh, the theory of stages was uh, was taken back, you know, was once again advanced by the Third International, the Communist International, and um, it played a terrible role. Uh, for example, in 1936 in Spain, when the revolution was occurring in Spain, um, the Communist Party there said, well, we have to support the local bourgeoisie and, uh, and uh, help establish capitalism in Spain. Um, and that's on the one hand, so that they were weakening the independent workers movement and the independent workers actions of seizing factories and seizing towns. And on the other hand, you had the, uh, I'll just mention in passing, you had the anarchists who were actually the, the dominant force in the movement who refused to take power. In Catalina, in Catalina, the workers had taken the factories, the peasants had taken the land and the power was laying in the streets and the anarchists refused to pick it up. And uh, you know, uh, the revolution was of course ultimately defeated by, by uh, the generals. So that, rev that revolution demonstrated a lot of things, but it, in relation to the permanent revolution, it, it demonstrated that, um, that following Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution um, would, was the way to proceed in uh, Spain. The, the uh, theory, of course, it also was demonstrated clearly in Russia. In 1917, uh, the Bolshevik party under Lenin had been up to 1917, had been advocating, as was said earlier in the seminar, uh, the slogan of, uh, of uh, power to the workers and peasants, a, de a democracy, a workers and peasants uh, democracy. And it was Trotsky disagreed with that. He said that the peasant is, peasants are, are in competition with, it, with each other, they're landholders. Um, they have, uh, it's hard for them to unite because they don't have, they have a common interest, but they're also in competition. And therefore the working class has to lead and has to earn the support of the peasants by giving them, giving the land to the peasants and breaking up the big land, uh, landed estates. So um, uh, as it turned out, Stalin and the other leaders of the, of the Bolsheviks that were in Russia were supporting the theory of stages when Lenin got back. Uh, I arrived back at fin the Finland station in uh, April and he wrote the April theses and he said, all power to the Soviets. He was not having anything to do with power to the Duma. He said, all power to the Soviets, which was exactly what Trotsky was saying. And that's, one of, that's how they got together. And Trotsky's uh, smaller group merged with the Bolshevik party and uh, he became an, a, an essential part of the Bolshevik leadership. He also understood in the context, the need for a disciplined revolutionary party. So. Um, Trotsky's theory that you had to go straight to workers' power and that the Duma uh, would, uh, was not where you would uh, place your support uh, proved absolutely true and Lenin realized that and, and supported it. The theory of permanent re revolution is closely connected with the law of uneven and combined development. The law was, draw was drawn from work by a Latvian theorist called Alexander Helphand, who was better known by his pseudonym Parvis, with whom Trotsky collaborated, as well as the Austrian Marxist Rudolf Hilferding, and further developed by Trotsky both during and after the Russian Revolution. Trotsky developed, uh, described how societies overall develop at different rates, so that different countries divide, not only develop at different rates, but even different parts of an economy within a country develop at different rates. and explained that by the early 20th century, 20th century, capitalism had created a global economy. Of course, Lenin had explained this as well, had created a global economy that linked productive forces in a world division of labor. Since capitalist development while happening at different rates in different countries takes place in an, in an overall context of a highly globalized and increasingly interdependent economy, sectors of a society can in effect leapfrog from an underdeveloped state to a highly developed this reality is reflected in the theory of permanent revolution 
as it becomes uh, up to the working class to push society forward. So in Russia, for example, you had a very advanced, you had very large industries with very modern technology um, uh, and uh, enmeshed in a society that still had much to do with feudalism, much to do with the bureaucracy of, of, a, of a czarist autocracy. It was very, uh, so it was not, so that, so that you see the, the uneven development. This is, this is uh, what we're really talking about here is that societies develop very unevenly. In the colonial world, of course, the capitalists prohibit uh, the development in the colonies. Ten minutes. Of Sorry, ten. Prohibit uh, development of competition in the colonies. What they use the colonies for is cheap labor on the one hand and raw, raw resources on the other. So those areas will be, you know, when the Canadian mining companies go into uh, a country in Africa or Latin America, they will take the absolute most modern technical machinery and the workers in that country learn to use that very modern technical machinery but the rest of the economy is still backward. So you have tremendously uneven development. Uh, this reality is, yeah, it, okay. So what, what was the meaning of this in Russian context? Russia was still a backward country, but it had nonetheless imported state-of-the-art industrial production. The small Russian working class was very new, but unlike the working class of Britain, for example, it had not gone through a century of reformism um, and had fewer illusions about capitalism than their Western counterparts and were politically more advanced. Another example of the unevenness of development. We see the dynamic of uneven and combined development in China today. China, which was uh, 40 years ago, was largely uh, an impoverished peasantry, has experienced rapid development in recent decades and a large urban working class created which who and that working class was only a generation ago, um, poor peasants, rural peasant backgrounds. Foreign and domestic firms have introduced state-of-the-art production throughout the country. Beijing and other cities have ultra-modern subway systems, often the envy of vi visiting North Americans, reminded of their own increasingly decrepit infrastructures back home. Lenin initially believed that because of Russia's underdevelopment and its weak bourgeois class competing with bourgeois democratic revolution, as in France, would be possible only through an alliance of workers and peasants. He felt the country would not need to get through an extended, to go through an extended period of capitalist development. Socialism would not be possible until there were successful workers' revolutions in Western Europe. So Lenin understood that the global nature of capitalism implies the global nature of the socialist revolution against it. In effect, Russia would have a bourgeois revolution without the bourgeoisie. Lenin put forward the slogan for a democratic dictatorship of the workers and peasants. Trotsky disagreed with Lenin's formulation. He felt the peasants, as I've said before, could not unify around common demands because they had in part similar, but just as importantly, in part conflicting interests with each other and would be politically torn in different directions. He also noted that an agrarian revolution would not be possible in the context of a purely bourgeois democratic revolution. This is because the, uh, the land, much of the land, although peasants did hold some land and serfdom had officially been ended, many of the peasants were still basically agricultural, uh, were tied to the land of big, still big feudal landowners. The Russian Revolution of 1917 led Lenin to agree with Trotsky on the, on the way to power and Trotsky to agree with Lenin on the tool, the Bolshevik party. Initially, the Duma was in charge. There, there, was, there was two forms of power existing, the Duma, the bourgeois parliament, and, there was, and then the Soviets that began to appear in Petrograd, Moscow, and then in other cities. And uh, so one was the power of the workers and the other was the power of the bourgeoisie. And you have really had two conflicting forms of government. Um, and um, eventually uh, the Soviets of course became the stronger. The Duma really achieved nothing of substance. They did not end Russia's participation in the brutal war in which uh, Russia, Russian peasants in, in, uh, as soldiers in the trenches were uh, dying by, the, by troves and they did not carry out land reform and they couldn't even provide 
food for the industrial workers. The October Revolution, when a revolutionary movement led by the working class took power, led by a Bolshevik organization, confirmed Trotsky's theory after uh, Trotsky's theory. After taking power, the Bolsheviks initially did not intend to abolish capitalism altogether immediately, largely in reaction to economic sabotage by Russian industrialists. The workers themselves began seizing the factories in a new wave of struggle for, from below, pushing the new Soviet government to begin to nationalize industry much more quickly. It's kind of interesting how the Bolsheviks were absolutely indispensable to creating the revolution, but the Bolsheviks can be pushed by uh, a militant class conscious class to move faster. And the point was the Bolshevik party were quickly able to respond. The concept of permanent revolution has two further major implications. First, that while revolutions erupt within particular states, for example, Russia or China or Cuba, they cannot be completed within the framework of a globally integrated imperialist system dominated by financial capital and commodities markets and the predations of imperialist military domination. There is no socialism in one country. The revolution must move forward or fall back. In the Soviet Union, for example, it finally collapsed back into capitalism. But Stalin and his government missed many opportunities to extend the revolution. For example, in Spain and even in Germany, the common turn took the idiotic position of calling the social democrats and their unions social fascists. If they had united with the social democrats, and the prospect was there for defeating the fascists, which would, would have opened a pre-revolutionary period in Germany. Uh, and so, you know, there are opportunities that could well have meant that the Soviet Union could still be a worker state. The second further aspect of the permanent revolution is that from workers' power, the revolution, after dealing with the inevitable counter-revolution and spreading globally, must move consciously forward to create an economic global surplus in the context of ecological sanity, establish full participation by all people in decision-making regardless of gender, sexual orientation, color, physical, or mental disability, or any other human attribute, um, move into a rational and caring society in which much, much less physical and mental disability will even exist, where the compulsive nature of the worker state becomes less and less and, and, uh, and begins Three to wither minutes. away, and we arrive at the portals of socialism. This is another aspect of the permanence of the revolution to carry right through to the gates of socialism. First proposed more than a, sorry, what was that last time thing? How Three minutes? minutes. Oh, good, thanks. First proposed more than a century ago, the theory of permanent revolution and the related law of uneven and combined development are powerful tools for understanding more recent class dynamics in underdeveloped countries of the global south. And, and as we can see, in, to, in different ways to all kinds of societies. After the Chinese Revolution of 1949, the Chinese Communist Party initially did not intend to nationalize private industry and discourage direct working class involvement. Of course, that was because uh, they were a Stalinist bureaucracy, Stalinist leadership. Economic, once again, economic sabotage by adults, as well as economic dislocation caused by years of war and revolution forced the state to intervene and in effect play the role of the working class played during the Russian Revolution. More recently, these events, uh, events of 2011's Arab Spring, notably in Egypt, showed the importance of an independent working class movement. After overthrowing Mubarak, a powerful revolutionary movement was derailed by a, by a middle class leadership and led to a military crackdown. Similar dynamics have played out in many other countries, as I'm sure Jeff will uh, explain. An organized conscious working class can lead, only an organized conscious working class can lead society forward. And the workers to win must be led by an experienced disciplined leadership consciously created out of the struggle of the workers and the oppressed. This latter task is represented by what we are doing here together this weekend. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gary. And now we will go to our next speaker, who is comrade Jeff Mackler, and he is the National Secretary of Socialist Action USA, the author of dozens of booklets, a member of the steering committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, 
a leader in the campaign to free Momia Abuja Jamel and to free Julian Assange. Jeff is based in Oakland, California. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Gary, <clears throat> for <clears throat> laying the foundations of my talk. And thanks for everybody attending. The theory of permanent revolution, I think was uh, the title was regretted when Marx was among the first to use it. Uh, if you say to someone, uh, uh, what do you think about revolutionary theory? And you say to a stranger, I'm for permanent revolution. They sort of think you're crazy. Like, uh, what do you mean <laughs> revolution? You mean every day of the week, we pick up our guns and start fighting? What does that mean? And uh, Trotsky gave it a very precise meaning. Basically, it was that in the modern era, the capitalist class is no longer capable of solving the problems that it solved 100, 150 years earlier, starting with the great French Revolution of 1789, including things like land reform. So <clears throat> I want to give you several examples of the debate on permanent revolution. Imagine in the middle of World War I, the entire world, the capitalist imperialist powers are fighting to divide the, con the world, to divide the Middle East, to divide Africa into different colonial spheres of influence. In the middle of that, <clears throat> you have a revolutionary socialist named Vladimir Lenin rowing a boat on a quiet Swiss lake. He gets news that there was a revolution in his country from which he'd been driven and exiled, his party underground. Lenin basically relegated <clears throat> to writing contributions to prepare at some future unspecified time for a revolutionary development. So, and Trotsky himself was in exile. He was in the Bronx editing a Russian language paper. Both of them tried to make immediate arrangements to get back to Russia. But Lenin had a problem. He had to travel through German occupied Russia. And Germany was at war, a German, a, a, uh, German occupied Eastern Europe. And Germany was at war with Russia. But he secured the consent of the German government to return to Russia. He got that consent because the Germans figured, well, here was a guy named Lenin, and he was for withdrawing the Russians from the war. So the Germans would only have to fight on the Western Front against France and the powers there. And if Lenin could get home and take the Russians out of the war, that would solve a big problem for them. Lenin didn't like that idea <clears throat> because the impression would be that he was a German agent, which is what his opponents in Russia called him. He entered a sealed train where no one from the German government was allowed traveled across Europe and entered Russia in St. Petersburg at the Finland station. Everybody knew he was coming. As Gary mentioned, the uh, Tsar had been overthrown and a provisional government headed by Alexander Kerensky was in power, a bourgeois government. It was led by the bourgeoisie and it had participants from the various socialist groups including the Mensheviks. So everybody said, let's go downtown. Uh, let's go down to the Finland station and see what this guy Lenin has to say. And sure enough, Lenin gets out of the train and stands on top of a, a car and is a little embarrassed. They give him bouquets of flowers. He wasn't a flower guy. And they say, well, what do you have to say? What do your Bolsheviks have to say? And Lenin gave a speech and he used the phrase, all power to the Soviets. All power to the Soviets. 
the Soviets weren't in power. The czar, the uh, bourgeoisie was in power headed by Kerensky and a capitalist government. And here's this crazy man coming from exile saying that the Soviets, which were parallel institutions, should rule the whole country. The idea that the workers should rule and not the capitalists. Lenin must be crazy, they said. Your guy is out of his mind. Lenin was a minority in his own party. The majority of his own party said, are you kidding? Can't make a socialist revolution in backward Russia. Karl Marx said that the socialist revolution can only take place in the most advanced capitalist countries. In the countries that had the economic, technical, industrial wherewithal to immediately solve the problems of all working people. Not in a backward country like Russia, which is 90% peasant, illiterate, poor, and steeped in religion. Lenin disagreed. And together with Trotsky, they conducted a battle and won the majority of the Bolshevik party. But they were still a minority in the workers' organizations, in the councils of workers that were now nationwide, the Soviets. Russia was the largest country in the world, a sixth of the land surface of the planet Earth, steeped in feudal, uh, feudal ideas. The Bolsheviks continued their fight. They had a program, and their program was aimed at winning the majority of the working class. They simplified the program by saying it was really just for bread, land, and peace food for the workers, an end to the imperialist war where Tsarist Russia was fighting German uh, imperialism, both imperialist countries. The Russians had made a deal with the allies that if the, uh, if the allies, by the way, the, uh, the Russia was allied with Japan in the war and with England and France and the Eastern countries against the, uh, against the, uh, Germany, Italy, and the Central Powers, and the old uh, Ottoman Empire. So they had made a deal that if the Russian side wins, they would get part of the, they would get the port of Constantinople. They would get their booty out of the war. Lenin said, no, we're gonna get out of this war and we're gonna give the land to the peasants. We're gonna give the working class control and we're going to grant freedom to the oppressed nations that have been forcibly incorporated into the Tsarist empire. Tsarist Russia was known throughout the world as the prison house of nationalities. Finally, in early October, for the first time, the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Soviets. The composition of the Soviets was akin to the <clears throat> Paris Commune. Their membership was constantly renewed. If you didn't do what you were elected to do in the factories that elected you, you were subject to immediate recall. So the composition of the Soviets, which were bodies that met on a, a, a district level, a citywide level, a regional level, and a national level, was ever changing. Imagine this, the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Soviets. And their slogan was all power to the Soviets. So what'd they do? Lenin called a meeting of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, and he made a proposal. His proposal was very simple. We take power in two weeks. We take power in two weeks. We have the authority of the Soviets. His own party thought he was a lunatic. Are you kidding? We Bolsheviks take power, Soviet power, in the largest country on earth, in the middle of an imperialist war, in two weeks? The majority voted to do it. And they appointed Trotsky, who was the former head of the 1905 Soviet, and a central leader 
in the 1917 Soviet and the head of the Soviet Foreign Military Revolutionary Committee. That committee was a subcommittee of the nationwide Soviet that was formed to defend the Soviets against the bourgeois attacks of the government. Trotsky planned an insurrection. Two weeks later, the government fell. A delegation of soldiers that had captured the Winter Palace, that it had 5,000 soldiers in it, almost all of whom surrendered, marched into the Winter Palace, threw open the doors where the bourgeois government was sitting there, and said, gentlemen, in the name of the workers, peasants, and soldiers, Soviet, you're under arrest. Your government is abolished. That night, Lenin and Trotsky sat on the floor of the Winter Palace and they drew up some decrees to present to the Soviet the next day, the nationwide Soviet. The first decree was very simple that we nationalize all of the land in the largest country on the planet Earth, and we grant it to the peasant Soviets to distribute according to their own rules. Two, we immediately call on Germany to end the war, to get out of the imperialist war. Three, we decree the right of self-determination of all conquered, czarist colonies, the people who had been captured, forced to speak the Russian language, denied their own history and culture, conquered peoples. Russia, as I said, was the prison house of nationalities. They presented these decrees and in the days to come, and they were adopted overwhelmingly by the all Russian Congress of Soviets. The land was immediately distributed almost from day one. The army was this, the czarist army was disbanded. The, and the Soviet government began to construct its own army. It started out with 5,000 working class leaders, members of the Bolshevik party and then the entire capitalist world on both sides of the imperialist war intervened into Russia. 17 countries invaded the poorest, most backward country in the world. They asked Trotsky to be the head of the Red Army and he formed an army of 10 million people who defeated the combined forces of the entire world. The British government, the French government, the German government, the, the old czarist army and every other invading country. Why did they, how are they able to do that? Because they adopted a program that met the needs of the people. The peasants fought on the Bolshevik side, on the Soviet side, because they were fighting for their own land, not the czarist land and not the restoration of their land to the capitalists if the revolution was defeated. The oppressed nationalities, the conquered peoples fought in the army led by the Bolsheviks. The peasants, the workers, the finest gave their lives to defend that revolution. Why that revolution ended up being defeated, not by imperialism, but when the Stalin faction took power I will briefly touch on, but now I want to go to another revolution, the Cubans. In 1959, a lawyer who was a member of the traditional bourgeois opposition party, the Orthodox Party of Cuba, his name was Fidel Castro, took a band of guerrillas up into the Sierra Maestra mountains and declared that he was going to get rid of the Batista government because the Batista government had abrogated the 1941 constitution of Cuba. And as a lawyer, he was going to resurrect that constitution. He was successful. His army 
a peasant army with workers, defeated the Batista army at great cost. Batista killed 50,000 people. Fidel marched into Havana, eventually with Che Guevara, and appointed a bourgeois government. Asked that government to carry out the basic demands, which was land reform. And lo and behold, the bourgeois government that Fidel appointed refused to do that. Now, I want you to understand, Fidel Castro came to the United States as a hero of the American press. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show, an entertainment show that had groups like the Beatles and Elvis Presley. And Ed Sullivan walked on stage in front of the entire American public with his arm around Fidel, who was dressed in military fatigues and said, ladies and gentlemen of America, I'd like to introduce you to the George Washington of Cuba, Fidel Castro. Castro took a bow and never said a word. Herbert Matthews, a New York Times reporter who wrote a damn good book on Cuba, visited Fidel in the Sierras and said to him, what's your program? And he said, I just want to reestablish democracy and the pre-Batista constitution. Never mentioned socialism. And he wasn't hiding it. The Communist Party of Cuba, Stalinist, was against the revolution. They called Fidel a Trotskyist, an ultra left guerrilla fighter, trying to make a revolution in a backward country that haven't even, haven't even gone through capitalist democracy. They captured the entire Batista army and the people in Cuba had mass tribunals and sports stadiums of Batista's rapists. And they voted in the thousands to shoot them Al Paradon to the wall. And the American ambassador went to Fidel and said, hey, you know, you have to have democracy, uh, civil liberties and civil rights. You have to call on your army to stop these mass tribunals. And Fidel said, no. And the executions continued. His bourgeois government refused to distribute the land under pressure from American capitalists who owned the land. Fidel dismissed the government and organized the largest land reform in the history of the world, except for the Russian revolution in the modern era. The United States said, we can't trust this guy. So they organized in 1961 an invasion at the Bay of Pigs. They sent an army that the CIA had trained. They expected the Castro government to fall within days, and if it didn't, they would plant the flag of this government and then follow it up with US troops. Fidel himself went to Playa Hiron, to the coast, to fight. It was a terrible battle. The Cuban revolutionaries lost a thousand people, but they defeated and captured the entire US backed army. At which point it became clear to Fidel and he decided to nationalize the capitalist class. This is a year and a half after the revolution down to the nails and the boots of their shoes. He didn't instantly nationalize the property. That began to mark a new era for the Cuban revolution. Our comrades in the SWP visited Fidel, my friend, Ed Shaw had a little Piper Cub in Miami. He used to fly down there. Joe Hansen, a central leader of the party, went down to meet the Cuban revolutionaries. We were skeptical. They didn't start out with the land reform. They didn't start out with a revolutionary program. They didn't start out by proclaiming their adherence to socialism because they thought they could reform capitalism. When they learned from experience that they could, they set an example that stands today before the entire planet. 20 years later, the Nicaraguans conducting a guerrilla war 
in Che Guevara's image said that they were going to overthrow the US-backed Somoza dictatorship. They at one point before the revolution literally stormed the Nicaraguan National Assembly and captured the entire government. 10 minutes. And held them hostage and traded them for the release of the Nicaraguan political prisoners. Our party at the time said that the Sandinistas, the FSLN, were ultra left, guerrilla fighters. They didn't win the majority of the working class. They sought to use an isolated peasant struggle. A few months later, the FSLN defeated the Somoza army and took power in Nicaragua, militarily speaking. But they didn't give the land to the peasants. They decided that was not appropriate. Let me give you some quotes. Thomas Borges, who was one of the central guerrilla leaders of the revolution, writing in New Left Review said, there is not nor could there be in Nicaragua an ideological project as clearly defined as the one that existed in Cuba. It is no accident that the Nicaraguan bourgeoisie has been given so many economic incentives, more even than the workers. We ourselves have been more attentive to giving the bourgeoisie economic opportunities than in responding to the demands of the working class. We have sacrificed the working class in favor of the economic, of the economy as part of a strategic plan. Francisco Pizarro, top economic advisor to the FSLN, writing in the fourth international magazine, Impracor said, taking the Cuban socialist road would not only be naive, but deeply irresponsible in the case of Nicaragua. Defense minister, Humberto Ortega, quoted in La Volca, uh, Nicaragua, a um, French publication said, we cannot solve at the same time the problems of national liberation and those of social liberation. We must first complete the stage of national independence and national liberation. Jaime Wheelock, the Minister of Agriculture of the Sandinistas said, it is important to understand that the socialist model is a solution for contradictions that only exist in developed capitalist countries. Even though we have socialist principles, we cannot affect the transformation of our society by socializing the means of production. I could go on and give you 20 quotes. They're all in a book that we wrote called Nicaragua, Dynamics of an Unfinished Revolution. But the Sandinistas decided on a different course. They didn't give the land to the peasants. They didn't nationalize bourgeois industry. They thought that if they did so, the United States would come after them. And that's exactly what the United States said they would do. The American ambassador said to the Nicaraguans, if you take the Cuban route, we didn't think Fidel would take the socialist route and he got away with it. We tried to stop and we were unsuccessful, but no more. If you take the Cuban route, we will invade you. We will isolate you. We will cut you off from the world market. We will stop all of your trade. We'll cut off your oil supply. Not to mention, we will send in forces like they did aiding the Contras in Honduras to overthrow you. Not to mention assassination squads, all of which were used against the Cubans. The Nicaraguans buckled, and 11 years after the revolution, when they had an election in 1990, Daniel Ortega lost. He conducted the election. The FSLN conducted the election in 1990, and the Sandinistas lost. The demoralized people didn't get the land. The FSLN never met in Congress. They never nationalized bourgeois property. They lost the confidence of the people because they thought they could solve the problems by ameliorating the contradictions in capitalist society and not offending the capitalist beast. 
That question today stands before every revolutionary. We had the same argument inside the Socialist Workers' Party when we were formed. The SWP dropped its theory of permanent revolution and defended the Sandinistas' refusal to give the land to the peasants, saying that permanent revolution is not some instant presto changeo philosophy. It takes time to win the confidence of the Nicaraguan people. But the Sandinistas lost the confidence of the Nicaraguan people because they didn't give them the land. The SWP had the same debate with us, which is the reason why we were expelled in South Africa. The SWP said Nelson Mandela's ANC government should not be a socialist government, should not nationalize bourgeois property, should not give the land to the South African poor, should not establish a worker state in the Cuban or Russian models. And that's exactly what the ANC did. They set up a bourgeois state. They set up a white racist capitalist state with a black mask of Nelson Mandela. And today the quality of life of the South African people and the ANC, which lost its majority support in the last election has never been lower because capitalism couldn't solve the problems of the South African people. And South Africa is the richest of all mineral rich nations in all of the African continent. But capitalism under the American African National Congress couldn't solve the problem. So the example of the Bolsheviks is still our example. They set up a system of workers' democracy. Its model was the Paris Commune. The representatives to the Soviets were sub subject to immediate recall. They gave the land to the peasants. They established a system of free health care for everyone. They withdrew from the imperialist war. They gave the oppressed nations the right of self-determination. They obliterated racial racist discrimination. They liberated women. They legalized abortion. They did it all within weeks of the revolution. Their revolution was defeated, not by 17 foreign nations, but by the eventual total isolation of the imperialist world. That's why the Bolsheviks tried to avoid that isolation. They tried to build a new international, a world party of socialist revolution. They came close. The Hungarians established a worker state in 1919. The Germans twice came close to abolishing capitalism, but didn't have the leadership to do it. The world went up for grabs during that war. In the end, isolated, beleaguered Russia succumbed to the bureaucratic shortages and the rise of the Stalin bureaucracy. The Cubans have survived unbelievably. They set the example of all of Latin America today. A poor beleaguered country of 11 million has free health care, free dental care, free transportation, the lowest rents in all of the continent, and the highest standard of living, the highest proportion of doctors to people, the highest proportion of PhDs. And it is not only isolated by imperialism, it is cut off from Venezuela, whose oil at least helped them a bit, and from the Soviet Union, who restored capitalism and left beleaguered Cuba to survive on its own, an isolated island. The miracle that has survived is directly attributable to the courage of its people, to its internationalism and our solidarity. So permanent revolution today simply means you can't beat capitalism by establishing a quote, democratic capitalism. It can't be capitalism in the United States by voting for the lesser evil, Bernie Sanders. You can't defeat capitalism by allowing a government of Daniel Ortega in alliance with the Council on- 30 Public seconds. Enterprise. My time's up. Did you 30 say- 30 seconds, please wrap up. Okay. 
by forming a government in alliance with the capitalist class in Nicaragua or in Venezuela, where the Venezuelan government tries to conduct reforms and yet the land is owned by the rich, the banks are owned by the rich, the factories are owned by the rich. Breaking with capitalism, building a world party, prioritizing the needs of the people, involving the people directly in the government of their country through workers' councils like the Bolsheviks is the, is the future. So permanent revolution isn't to conclude some abstract slogan about let's fight every day, let's run around with the red flag, let's fight the police and the army. It has nothing to do with our view. It has to do with the fact that in the modern era, to solve the problems of bourgeois society, whether it be in a poor country or an advanced capitalist country, working class independence is a priority. The formation of a disciplined revolutionary party is a necessity. The mobilization of the working class majority is a necessity. Building an international party that defends worker struggles everywhere is a prerequisite. That's why we are internationalists. That's why we build disciplined revolutionary parties. That's why we participate in every single struggle of the working class against all imperialist wars, against racism, sexism, LGBT prejudice, climate crisis, global warming, and capitalist pandemics. There's nothing alien to us regarding any struggle where working people seek to defend their interests. We seek to unify them, to win their hearts and minds, to organize them through independent working class institutions to challenge capitalist power, transform society, and build an egalitarian socialist society that represents the interests of all workers and all humanity. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Gary. Okay, so now we're going to move to the Q&A. And uh, I have three, the first three questions are coming from the chat. And the first one is from Comrade Myrna. She says, she asks, is there credibility to the U.S. with Miami Cubans causing another disruption to Cuba tomorrow on the 15th of November? The second question is from Alex, Comrade Alex. What are your thoughts on Vietnam? Is that a socialist country? Why or why not? And then we have a question from Comrade Flo. What are your thoughts on recent developments in Latin America and how can the permanent revolution extend to neighboring countries in the region? What do you think is the greatest obstacle to revolutionary movements there currently? And you each have up to four minutes and we will start with Jeff and then Gary. You're muted, Jeff. The Miami Cubans, thanks for your questions, are supported and organized financially by the CIA and their aim is to overthrow the Castro government. They tried it by assassination. They tried it by blowing up buildings, by poisoning crops, by using poison, uh, uh, poisoning the pigs, and they've been unsuccessful. There's nothing democratic about them. They are the people who lost their property and wealth when the vast majority of the Cubans took power. They are trying to organize protests in Cuba, which they're financing through the CIA, the National Endowment for Democracy and other institutions. They believe that the combination of total isolation of Cuba, embargo of Cuba, blockade of Cuba, Cuba getting no aid from Venezuela, no oil, no help from Russia, that combination can starve the people into rebelling. I don't think they'll be successful, but they have caused great misery. Vietnam, the United States invaded Vietnam in a 10 year war that slaughtered 4 million people. It was a genocidal war. The Vietnamese were successful, a gain for humanity. But the Vietnamese Communist Party, a Stalinist party, capitulated and like the Soviet Union and China, restored capitalism in that country and today are a central source 
of cheap labor for US, foreign, British, and other corporations. A terrible tragedy where the Vietnamese Communist Party took the Chinese road and pioneered that path back to capitalist restoration. Latin America, the example of permanent revolution is classic. In one country after another, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, the opposition forces sought the reform of capitalism, not its abolition. They set up governments that maintain capitalist wealth and property and banking institutions, including under Evo Morales, where the wealth of the country was still in the hands of the banks and the major uh, operators of Bolivia's tin mines and so on. In every one of these countries, the opposition leaders believed that they could solve the problems in the framework of a little liberal capitalism. In every one of those countries, they were defeated by a combination of boycott, assassination, invasion, organized CAA coups like in Bolivia and demoralization of the people. In every Latin American country today, the central task is to build revolutionary parties to challenge capitalism while simultaneously organizing the working class to oppose every single aspect of US imperialist intervention embargoes. We support the right of all of Latin America to self-determination, to be free from imperialist blockades while simultaneously building a revolutionary party to abolish capitalism the way the Cubans have. 30 seconds. Day. I'm done. Okay, Gary. Four minutes. Took me a minute there to unmute. Well, uh, I like Jeff's answers. Actually, uh, uh, the uh, gusanos or worms in Spanish. Uh, who left uh, Cuba to uh, go to Miami, um, do not have, as Jeff said, do not have any idea about that. Their goal is not democracy. Their goal is the reestablishment of themselves uh, in the ownership of the Cuban economy. And that's, uh, that's their goal. So it is to take away the gains of the Cuban revolution for the Cuban people. Um, you know, the Cuban people have proven extraordinarily heroic and their leadership has has, uh, you know, with missteps here and there as in any leadership, including even uh, the Russian Revolution, um, has shown remarkably flexible about learning the lessons of the permanent revolution as, they, uh, as the problems came up and taking the steps to move forward, which was a, a very Three uh, uh, thing to, uh, you know, uh, a very set of wise moves that they did. Um, eventually, Cuba has to have help. Cuba has to, the revolution has to extend. Um, you know, uh, the more the, you know, it cannot last forever as a, as, as a, as a worker state all by itself. So uh, it needs all the support that we can give it. It needs all the effort that we can muster in order to undermine American imperialism. It could well use support uh, from uh, Latin America, spreading the revolution in Latin America or anywhere else in the world. Um, that's the way forward for Cuba is the rev is the spread of the revolution is is uh, the rise of the working class uh, as as revolutionary allies in, in state power in other countries. Um, the um, Vietnam uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party had a history of uh, we never said support the NLF. Some a lot of people on the left did. We never said support the NLF. We said out now and self-determination for the Vietnamese. Um, because the NLF, we knew the history of the NLF. The NLF had murdered Trotskyists. Uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party had, uh, had uh, murdered Trotskyists. Hanoi, uh, I mean, uh, Ho Chi Minh was, was a vicious anti-Trotskyist. So we had no illusions about the leadership ever uh, in Vietnam, but we still absolutely supported their right of self-determination. We absolutely opposed the predations of the American military and uh, and you know the Vietnamese and the world movement that was was 
very much, uh, very strong part of its leadership was Trotskyist, um, did win. And uh, then, of course, the Stalinists gave it away. Um, and finally, well, Latin America, I'm going to leave what Jeff said on the table. I'm not really, a, it's not one of my areas of strength. I'm more, uh, more into uh, uh, Middle East and uh, some of those areas, but I have not adequately followed the revolution in Latin America. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have three more questions in the chat. The first one comes from Kiri. Does failures of Afghanistan enable capitalist countries as the US to resort to nuclear weapons in the future, in the future conflicts? The next one is from Mark Lister. Thoughts on communist revolutions in Africa in the 20th century and why they eventually fell. For example, Burkina Faso and Angola. And then the next one is from Emily. What does a backwards economy mean? What aspects of the economy does that refer to? And you have five minutes, comrades, and I'll start with Gary and then Jeff. Sorry, what was the third one? What does a backward economy mean? What aspects of the economy does that refer to? Okay. And backwards is in quotation. Yeah. Well, a backward economy uh, is a has, five minutes. Okay, has a low productivity, provides you know the uh, it has has it has uh, uh, there's there's three principal elements in my mind. One is the technology is is not up to date. The <clears throat> that includes the training of the workers as well as the actual um, sophistication of the of the equipment and. Uh, and so on, but it also means a backward system of social organization. And that can be anything from feudal to capitalist, but it's, uh, um, it, so those are all elements of a backward economy. The result is low productivity, uh, except perhaps in an area where imperialism is concentrating in which they will bring in the uh, most modern machinery to extract the resources. Uh, Burkina Faso, uh, where Canadian mining, gold miners operate, the gold mines are, uh, are way more efficient than they were um, a while ago. There was about 25,000 miners, small miners, uh, who eked out an existence from the, from the gold that they could take by uh, hand tools out of the mines. And that mine, those mines would have lasted decades and decades that way and kept, uh, kept people uh, making a living. The Canadians have come in and they have the most modern equipment and it's expected that in four or five years all that gold will be gone. They drove off the miners, uh, we're using uh, mercenaries um, who beat the miners uh, and killed them and said they were trespassing on, on um, land over which the Canadian company held license to exploit. There were guerrillas, uh, some guerrillas attacked a busload of workers that were all Burkino, uh, Burkino workers and killed a whole bunch of them because they uh, wanted to, because the Canadians don't come by bus, they fly in and fly out. So Wait it's much, much harder to get to them. Um, the Canadian army has, uh, has uh, troops in, in, uh, in, the, in a neighboring country, just over the border from where the mines are. And it was, uh, that, that was supposed to be some peaceable mission, but really they were sent there to defend the mines and, um, and so uh, th that's a backward country. They, all, they even imperialists were even refused, this Canadian company refused to pay royalties, refused to pay taxes, and finally settled for cents on the dollar with the government. Um, so they, they don't obey the law. They don't, they don't value human life. They, they murder, they, uh, and they steal all the resources at, at very, very low rates, uh, cheap labor. It's just a, it's just a, so, so that area has advanced equipment, but the rest of the economy doesn't. It's, it's uh, organizationally backward, uh, technologically backward, the education levels are low, and that results in low productivity and low standard of living. So there's that one. Uh, Vietnam. Um, well, no, I have, that's, not, that's not one of the questions. Afghanistan, the United States, 
is always considering the nuclear option. There's uh, lunatics in the, uh, well, I consider them lunatics, in the Pentagon who uh, believe that technical nuclear weapons are always an option, uh, or that would, instead of giving, giving up power in the United States, would threaten the uh, world with nuclear Armageddon. And they calculate how many people would die and how many would be left alive. And they actually make calculations that uh, show that they believe somehow they would survive a nuclear devastation. Um, so yeah, nuclear is always an option. I mean, it's what it was two massive existential threats is the threat that the climate may become uninhabitable for humans and a lot of other forms of life, or that it may uh, by, through climate change, climate global warming, or through nuclear uh, catastrophe. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think Afghanistan any more than any other defeat makes them think that. I think that's their mental framework. They, uh, uh, they're actually escalating the, uh, the nuclear uh, arms race again, seconds. partly to um, sustain their military industrial complex as they're constantly developing new, new weapons and so on, but partly because they want to, th they're using it as threats against Russia and China, who uh, refuse to cooperate in the way that they want them to. And uh, so they're prepared to uh, threaten them with nuclear weapons as well as sanctions and all the other tools of imperialism. Uh, so I guess that's the end for me. Okay, Jeff, five minutes. <clears throat> um, on Emily's question, Cuba was a backward country. It was a one crop economy. Under Batista, its main economic uh, economy was drugs, prostitution, and gambling. It was the whorehouse for American rich, and it produced sugar. The Cubans weren't able to fundamentally transform that. They tried. Che Guevara became the minister of economics and nationalized all of the industries in the country. With the Russian help, which the Cubans were right to accept, they rebuilt the nickel mines that were owned by US corporations. They had to, they didn't have the spare parts to repair any machines. They were cultivating the land with oxen, not tractors. So they got tractors from Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. The strength of their economy and their salvation was they won the hearts and minds of the Cuban people. They built a diversified economy with the help of Russia and China to some extent and Eastern Europe. Those have all been cut off. So the Cubans are beleaguered as never before in their history and yet continuing to survive. But the United States believes that it's a chance, another chance to overthrow them. In Africa, there were revolutionary movements, starting with Algeria. I marched down the streets with the Cubans and the Algerians in 1962 at the World Youth Festival. They had overthrown the French colonial administration and Ahmed Ben Bella, uh, who uh, became the prime minister of the country. He made some modest reforms but he never abolished the bourgeois army. The Russians did away with the capitalist army and built their own. The Cubans built their own army and armed it. It was a people's army. The Algerians never did. In Angola, with the help of the Cubans, who sent tens of thousands of troops to defeat a South African intervention, they defeated that and that represented gains for the Angolan people. But the Angolan government never challenged capitalist rule, never challenged the ownership of the wealth of that country by the world's imperialist system. Two minutes. A reform leadership. The Cubans supported it, their right to self-determination. It led eventually 
to the independence of Namibia and the South African liberation, but not to the abolition of capitalism in those countries. So the MPLA, the Angolan National Liberation Front, never challenged capitalist rule. They thought they could coexist with it. And it's the same thing with Thomas Sankara in, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, a tiny nation. I met Thomas Sankara in Nicaragua at a Sandinista international conference. They did not nationalize bourgeois property. They did not seize control of the army. They thought they could conduct reforms on their own with a government that was literally overthrown in a matter of days. The SWP that we were expelled from championed Thomas Sankara because he took the Nicaraguan route, because he refrained from challenging capitalist property. In order to challenge capitalist property, you need the mass support of the people who run those industries. 30 second. So none of those did that. I don't have time to go into the question of nuclear war. Our view is we are for the total abolition of all nuclear weapons beginning with the United States, who has more nuclear weapons than the entire world, who is the only nation to ever use nuclear weapons. The moron Trump literally called on the National Security Council to increase the number of tactical nuclear weapons by 100 fold. The end of the threat of nuclear war will happen, coincide with the end of imperialism. The beast, beleaguered as it will be, may resort to nuclear war. Our only answer is to defeat that beast, to organize the vast majority of the American people to fight for their own freedom and liberation. And the first thing they will do is abolish the imperialist armies where the United States has military bases, 1,100 of them in 120 countries around the world. We'll save a trillion dollars a year. Please wrap up. Allow the world self-determination by bringing all the troops home now. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Gary. Okay, so we have, uh, let me see, just one second. Okay, no, we just don't have another message. Just hang on, folks. Okay, so we just have two speakers, uh, two uh, yeah, speakers on the stack right now, but one is a two part question. So I will go with that and then maybe there will be other people decide after that to ask a question. So here we go. Uh, the next one is from Robbie, comrade Robbie. He says, yes, the Cuban revolution has proven remarkably resilient, but it is ultimately possible but is it ultimately possible to build socialism in Cuba? And if so, how should Cuba navigate the contradictions that traditional Cuban society faces? And the next questions, two parts, is from Barry, comrade Barry. In the age of permanent revolution, when the possibility of workers' conquest of power is tangible, delay means defeat and catastrophe. At the same time, the imperial rulers know how vulnerable their cruel system is when the masses are in political motion. What duty does that impose on defenders of workers' rights, defenders of self-determination for oppressed nations like Venezuela and Palestine? Should socialists hold back solidarity until the leaders of beleaguered unions and governments in poor countries are more to our liking? Then he continues to say, can you describe what socialist action is doing to oppose imperialist intervention, to oppose tyranny and injustice that our government and corporations foster around the world? I will give you six minutes each to answer these questions and we will start with Jeff. Good questions. You know, Ravi's question is an amazing question. It basically says, how can a beleaguered poor nation, which has survived for 60 years in the face of an embargo, continue to survive when the United States under Biden, not to mention Trump, 
has tightened the blockade, barred Cuba from trading with any nation on earth. Any ship that lands in Cuba can't do business in any US port. Cuba has been cut off from Venezuelan oil, which has been basically embargoed by the United States. It has no aid from capitalist Russia and China. How can it continue to survive? Part one of that answer is it has survived for 60 years. It has not been able to build the model socialist society. As one of our previous speakers said, it has one of the most advanced biotechnology industries in the world, producing five vaccines on the one hand, but it doesn't have the technology to produce syringes to inoculate the people. So the percentage of inoculation is only something like 20%, an example of the contradiction in a poor country beleaguered. In the end, either there is a breakthrough with other nations coming to the aid of revolutionary Cuba, or the Cubans will be starved into submission where the same kind of pressure that the United States puts on Venezuela or Nicaragua or whatever, forces the Cubans to succumb. No one can stand up forever against the imperialist beast. When I say beast, it's an under exaggeration. It's an understatement. The beast murdered 1.5 million people in Iraq, over 2 million people in Afghanistan, dismembered Libya, killed 500,000 in Syria. It supported a death squad government in Guatemala that killed 400,000 indigenous people. And Batista and Somoza dictatorships backed by the United States killed 50,000 each in the year. The United States is a terrorist nation that sacrifices everything in the world to its own profits and control. Any nation that challenges it is embargoed, blockaded, invaded, <laughs> or subject to endless terrorist acts, drone wars, secret operation wars, Three CIA minutes. special wars, assassination wars, sanction wars, and so on. That's why our job is so central to build a world revolutionary party. In the United States, oh, by the way, Barry's question is perfect. Yes, we are critical of every Bush regime on earth, but in regard to poor and oppressed nations by imperialism, we support their right of self-determination free from imperialist control. Indeed, that's the only way we can win the solidarity of the people in those countries by being seen as the best fighters against imperialism, by mobilizing people against imperialism, and at the same time for their own class interests against their own national bourgeoisie that tried to negotiate peaceful settlements with the imperialist beast. Finally, on the anti-war question, we are the most profound builders of the anti-war movement in the United States. We organized demonstrations against the war in Iraq in 2003 of 300,000 people on both coasts. We sent, spent 10 years building the anti-intervention movement in Central America to defend Nicaragua and El Salvador and Grenada. We formed 10 years ago, the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, that mobilizes demonstrations against US intervention everywhere in the world and supports working people's struggles. So any serious revolutionary party has to stand in the forefront of opposition to US imperialist war, in the forefront of defending the right of self-determination abroad and the right of self-determination of oppressed people in the United States against racist attacks, supporting Black Lives Matter, fighting for their independence of the Democratic Party. I think I've answered most of the questions. Gary can cover the others. Okay, Gary, go ahead. 
Well, in Cuba, I mean, I, I, I obviously agree with what Jeff has said about the heroism and consistency and persistence of the Cuban people. Uh, but we have to remember that socialism, sorry, I hear somebody on the, I'll, go, I'll just go ahead. Uh, but we have to remember what socialism is. And socialism is built, and the other thing is that they've used their resources very well. Uh, as Jeff was saying, you know, they developed several vaccines and didn't have the technology to develop um, the needles to, uh, to inject them. But they've done the best they could, and they've done it uh, repeatedly. For example, I saw a, um, a documentary on Cuba which showed that when they were when they could not get fertilizer after the Soviet Union collapsed, and they started, they, they were very experimental, and they started using uh, more traditional methods like manure and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then they uh, had scientists down uh, in the water uh, examining the coral reefs, and they found that the coral reefs were started to come back, and they found that they now have among the best, uh, most healthy coral reefs in the world. And the reason is that they don't use artificial fertilizer. And so they, they're very proud of the fact that they have uh, been increasing their agricultural production while using uh, uh, much more ecologically sensible uh, approaches to agriculture. Um, uh, but socialism is based on surplus and uh, not scarcity. And it's based on being able to meet the needs of uh, all of society from the poorest uh, for including all the poorest people. And, you know, the United States is simply denying Cuba the right to uh, have that kind of, of uh, surplus, doesn't allow them to trade what they produce, doesn't allow them to get what they need. And, um, and so that's not a basis for Four socialism. Um, it, it is a base, it is a, a worker state, it is doing the very best it can, but it cannot move forward under these circumstances to, to socialism. It can defend itself as best it can and hope against hope that it will be uh, it will, that revolutions also will come to its aid and that solidarity movements can can come to its aid. Uh, that's 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 the first thing. The second thing is, uh, well, I, again, I agree with Jeff. It's funny how often I agree with Jeff. I wonder why. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, solidarity, our interest is with the people of the uh, the oppressed and exploited of the world. And so, uh, you know, whether there are bourgeois governments in power, but imperialism is exploiting them and taking advantage of them and, and paying them dirt uh, poor wages and stealing their resources, which to some extent are, are the heritage of the nation, the natural heritage of the, of the nation. Um, we obviously oppose that. We, we always support the oppressed against the oppressors. And again, as Jeff said, it doesn't depend on which, who's in power at the moment. We can criticize the people. You know, we, we criticize those governments to the extent they don't do the, carry on the best fight against imperialism. But we certainly call for self-determination and we certainly oppose imperialist intervention and we fight it strongest. Our duty here in the imperialist heartlands is to fight against our governments. That's our job, and uh, in, in defense of the people of the of the poor people and the working class people of the world. Are, are we missing okay. a question? Oh. Uh, I had I had the feeling that both Jeff and I missed one, but I could be wrong. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, the questions was from Robbie. I think you covered that. You covered Robbie's question. Uh, Barry was the other one. And Barry was the other one, yes. Yeah. Okay. But it was a two-part question from him. I'm trying to follow the chat here as much as I can. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. Now let's see where we're going from here. Uh, okay. So we is there anybody that uh, I'm going back for one more question the second time around? Is there anybody that hasn't spoken yet? We have time for maybe one or two. So, but just put your hand up. You know your your technical hand. Yeah, I have you, Carrie. I have your question in the chat. Um, anybody else? Spotters to see before we... Um... Okay, so I only see the one. Okay, so this is from Carrie. 
and it says U.S. corporations are shifting to India, while China already took over island of Sri Lanka below for built and road initiative. Does that accelerate the confrontation between China and U.S. in the future? So that's the only question I have. So I'm going to give, uh, we'll start with, uh, with um, uh, Gary and then go to Jeff. And I will give you each six minutes that you can also cover something that maybe you left out or thought about since that you want to tell the comrades. So we'll start with the question and then you can talk on whatever you wish for the remainder of your time. And you each have six minutes each. We'll start with Gary. Okay, well, of course, uh, one of the things that China, uh, as we were discussing, uh, just as the session was coming together, should be apologizing to, the United, apologizing to the United States for, is moving its coast so close to the U U.S. Navy. Because um, <laughs> it seems to get closer and closer to the, uh, to the carrier groups of the United States. Uh, the United States is organized, uh, is organizing every day more and more military bases around the South China Sea, and uh, sees uh, China is definitely the the number two power in the world, and uh, China and the United States correctly identifies it as its major competitor. Um, the United States has they have they have a, a very well stated, written down, and agreed on policy that nobody can supersede the United States. They will do whatever is necessary to remain the number one imperialist nation on earth. Uh, so, and they speculate openly about the inevitability of war with China. And of course we say no war with China. It's no imperial, you know, there's no reason for uh, any workers to get involved in these wars. Uh, China on the other hand is uh, also trying to give itself an alternative to the South, to the China Sea coast by opening itself up to Europe and to the Middle East and, and also uh, by extension to Africa. And the Belt and Road Initiative is a massive, uh, massive uh, project that involves um, extending uh, super conduits of transportation and trade through, across through the Gobi Desert and all through the, the uh, uh, you know all the lands over to over to Europe and down towards the Middle East. Um, the Chinese are, are negotiating. I don't know the terms of the uh, deals that are being made with other companies, Four other minutes. countries to do uh, to do these to build this uh, this new Belt and Road Initiative, and what the nature of it is. Um, but it's uh, it's the Chinese goal is to open up another. Uh, alternative to the South China Sea. The United States is very much opposed to that and it will try to do everything it can to undermine the, uh, the, uh, that initiative. One of the things that they've done is to highlight uh, what they call a high level of uh, oppression of, um, I can't think of what they're called, the people, uh, the westernmost province of China can somebody just yell out what the name of those people are? Xinjiang. Yeah. The Uyghur, the Uyghur people. The Uyghur people, that's right. So, uh, uh, and they're making a big deal about that as if they, uh, you know, the way they've, they've treated uh, other nations around the world, that they are not in a position to criticize how China is uh, treating the Uyghur people because they've, they've, as Jeff read out the list of hundreds of thousands and millions of people in colonial areas that they have murdered themselves. So, uh, uh, you know, they're certainly not critical. It's that uh, they call it um, genocide, but that area has uh, the highest birth rate in China and the most rapidly rising population. So I'm sure there's certainly a uh, great Han chauvinism in China and certainly oppression of people who are not of the Han uh, uh, of, of the Han uh, ancestry. Uh, so I'm, I'm not saying that China doesn't treat the uh, Uyghur people unequally or uh, reprehensibly, minutes. but uh, I think it's an exaggeration to call it uh, to call it uh, genocide. Um, 
so yes, uh, the Road and Belt Initiative is just one more step in uh, in the uh, competition between China and the United States. Uh, China is trying to open itself up more for uh, trade and investment, and the United States is trying to stop it. Um, it's a, it's the way of uh, of uh, you know struggles between uh, these uh, economic giants. What was it? Is that the only question? Yes, there was just one okay. question. I gave okay, you extra well, that, yeah. time to uh, speak to whatever you want. Yeah, I, I you know, the, the, one of the things we can say is the theory of permanent revolution sheds he, a huge amount of light on all of the issues facing us today, because it always comes down to the fact you can't rely on the bourgeoisie anywhere. The bourgeoisie cannot advance human society and can only drag it down and backwards. And the, the theory of permanent revolution sheds a clear light on that. Whether we're talking about, uh, you know, the uh, oppressed colonies, or whether we're talking about uh, former worker states, or whether we're talking about uh, the advanced capitalist countries, the idea is that you don't compromise with the bourgeoisie. You don't vote for the Democratic Party. You don't support a bourgeoisie or believe that there's that we have to seconds. go through a, an industrial capitalist stage before you can even broach the question of workers' power. The the road forward is workers' power around the world. And, and the dismantling of the bourgeois armies, the dismantling of the bourgeois state, and the abolition of the bourgeoisie as a class, and the building of workers' power. And that's, uh, I think that's what permanent revolution puts squarely on the agenda everywhere. Okay, thank you, Gary. Even though I closed the list, it seems Rosemary has just put a question in, but it's sort of for the US. So I will, I will add it to you, Jeff. I will give it to you and I'll give you an extra minute. Uh, to, instead of six, you will have seven. And the question is this, is the US attitude towards China and Russia not so much the product of competition for market share, although that is also very true with respect to China, as the need to have enemies so as to justify increased weapon production to fuel the military industrial complex. So I'll leave that one with you, Jeff. Uh, sorry, Gary, I just got the question in. And Jeff, you have seven minutes. Thanks. Um, first, socialist action USA has taken the position that China is a lesser imperialist country. And we produced a document of about 75 pages that demonstrates that. China is number one in the world in billionaires. It has 1,026 billionaires, whereas the poor United States only has about 700 billionaires. In both cases, these billionaires, almost trillionaires, in both countries have had their profits tripled because of their stock market investments. In China, which invests heavily in the US stock market and US capitalists invest in the Chinese stock market. China's Belt and Road Initiative is to advance the interests of Chinese capitalism, which is led by the Communist Party in China which has nothing, nothing to do, in my view, with socialism. China began the restoration of socialism in 1979 with the coming of power of Deng Xiaoping. And that's continued with the Xi government in that country. When China was poor, it sold its people to the United States corporations who switched their factories to China to escape union wages where they could pay in China in US owned corporations, Chinese teenage girls working for six cents an hour. The whole world went to China and India and Vietnam and Indonesia, because they could have workers working in state-of-the-art factories for near slave wage labor. That's the way that China became a major imperialist power. 
it sold its workers to the imperialist corporations. The United States has 1,100 military bases outside its borders. The Chinese only have one because they are latecomers in, at the Horn of Africa. I forgot the nation. Because they are latecomers to the imperialist world. But that's the purpose of the Belt and Road Initiative. The just completed COP26 in Britain didn't have China and their present president because they are the number one producer of fossil fuels in the world. And Boris Johnson, the right-wing conservative party president, uh, prime minister, bragged that Britain under the, in the recent periods in the last decade or so has reduced fossil fuel emissions by 44%. What he didn't mention was that he did that by offshoring major British manufacturing to China who increased their fossil fuel load. And it's the same with the United States. The United States ships jobs to cheap labor around the world for the Chinese capitalists to exploit. And then the United States gets angry when the Chinese seek to use the state-of-the-art technology that the US uses to better American corporations so they can be more competitive on world markets. That's what it's all about. A lesser imperialist country like China is now becoming a competitor on world markets. They can produce goods cheaper than anywhere on the planet Earth because their supply chain, which includes oppressed nations that they exploit around the world, is superior to the United States. So they are becoming a world imperialist power. China doesn't have free medical care for everyone, free dental care for everyone. It's run by a privileged bureaucracy that is intertangled with the capitalist class of that country, headed by billionaires come trillionaires. So what we're seeing is an increased imperialist rivalry. It has nothing to do with the old Cold War, where China was a worker state that helped Vietnam and so did uh, Russia and Cuba. Today, those countries don't give aid to anybody other than at a price, an exploitive price. If China wanted to, it could bail out Cuba and Venezuela, but it's not profitable for Chinese capitalists to do that. So it's a misnomer and miseducation of people to refer to China because it has a communist party that orchestrated the transition to capitalism, to call that a worker state or a capitalist state. We've written a lot about it and we'll write more. On a, another question about Cuba, quoting someone from a Che Guevara brigade saying that they have uh, produced more with oxen than tractors. Sadly, that's not true. The Cubans themselves said the transition to using tractors was a tremendous gain in saving human labor because the sugar cane was cut by hand and the, tilled by a single oxen with a human being there. During the sugar cane uh, season only, 30 seconds. When the rest of the season, how much time do I have left? 30 seconds. The rest of the year, aside from the sugar harvesting, people were unemployed. Today, Cuban workers work at qualitatively better conditions. Sugarcane is among the harshest with the highest industry rate. But they're involved in PhD programs in scientific research, as well as manufacturing a broad range of products that the revolution has allowed them to do. So we are for the rational, sustained, clean substitution of machines for human labor and not returning to the hand labor. We can do that efficiently and clean uh, in this modern world as Cuba has demonstrated. 
Okay, thank you. And in fact, a special thanks to Gary and, and Jeff, and of course, all of our speakers in this conference, as well as to Emily, who you will hear from again soon, for her beautiful voice, and to our technical producers, our timekeepers, and our spotters. It was an honor to co-sponsor uh, this, this uh, conference with our sister party, uh, SAUS, and it was a pleasure for me to work with my co-chair, Comrade Anne. So please consider being a, oh yes, before I go on, also a special thanks to our, our, our comrades uh, who brought greetings from Mexico, Ireland, and Greece. So please consider being a supporter of the Socialist Action newspaper, which we will send to you online. And to fill out the form, just visit the website www.socialistaction.ca. And also, if anyone here would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just call 647-986-1917. Or if you want to join Socialist Action US, call 510-268-9429 or get in contact with them to socialistaction.org. And just to pause for the cause, we are pleased to announce that the NDP Socialist Caucus in Ontario will host a conference on Saturday, November the 20th to prepare for the next Ontario NDP convention. If you are interested, call 647-986-1917 and visit www.ndpsocialistcaucus.ca. Once again, folks, if you like this conference on revolutionary socialist strategy, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. So now let's celebrate this conference by ending in a musical note. Emily, who you've heard before, Emily Stairs, a leading member of Socialist Action, soprano vocalist and music teacher based in Guelph. Join us now, Emily, in singing the Internationale. Hello, comrades. Thank you all so much. This has been such a wonderful discussion. I know I've learned a lot and I'm looking forward to discussing all of this more with many of you. So thank you so much for yet another wonderful educational. In concluding this, we thought it would be only right to sing the Internationale. So I'll be singing this once in French, once in English. Please join in and as always, please mute yourselves if you're going to sing along. But I appreciate being able to see you singing along even if I can't hear you. And here's to being able to rise up and sing a rousing chorus sometime in the near future. De pour les dames et de la terre, de pour les forces de la femme, la raison dans ton cratère, c'est l'éruption de la femme. Du pas et fais en table rase, foule l'esclave de Let it stand in the place.
Okay, superb comrade as usual, superb. So, sisters and brothers, comrades and friends and siblings, we hope to see you again soon at upcoming events. In the meantime, please be safe, stay healthy, stay active. So bye for now.